gotta oil this chair. It's not even that old. Creaky. But it's really damn comfortable. Hi, everybody. This is Allison from Alley Cat Creations. How are you? Share, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. I thank you in advance. If you have done so, you rock. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you get anything from my work, a connected dot. I tried, didn't connect that well. An epiphany. A mind blown moment. A mushroom cloud moment. A new book to read, a new author to explore. Please consider supporting my work. All the all those little ways you can do that is at the bottom. And if you want to find me via email, social media, all those links are down there as well. I try, try, that's a good word, to keep up on my Telegram channel. I share a plethora of other things that I do outside of this channel. Um, I'm a ninja behind the scenes of We Not Me. So I post a lot of the shows there and other interesting spiritual things. But I always tell people they can post whatever they please as long as it's respectful. And then Facebook, I have my, this channel and then my private page. If you would like to be a friend on my private page, you just have to message me that you're from my channel. So I know who I'm letting in because I'm very, not necessarily private, but I have to protect myself at every damn cost. Realms of the Living Dead. I was going to do Manly P. Hall. But um, this, this one, the chicken dinner. The winner, winner, chicken dinner. Before I begin, I am air drying my hair. I did a mega ton of yard work that didn't get to happen because of those tree limbs that fell. I had like five to six really large, not the small little tiny branches. I mean, I'm talking about large ass tree limbs that fell last week and um it took me forever to get them out and off my property not that they're off my property it's just in pieces and places um and i had to mow my lawn trim some of the hedges i have little bushes in the front weed whack do all that fun stuff and has to get done and i do it myself so that was my day. I'm tired. Okay. Chapter 24. Independent communications continued. The message of the Sphinx. This should be quite interesting. The curtain. Can't possibly figure out the curtain thing yet. Let's start with the message of the Sphinx. One evening, while sitting around a blazing wood fire, there was placed in the hands of Miss Curtis a small stone image of the Sphinx, which had been brought to her direct from a royal tomb in Egypt. Holding it lightly and unthinkingly, in her hands, and while conversating about Egypt, suddenly the following psychometric message poured into her consciousness and was written down verbatim as it fell from her lips. She's a channel. Out of the distant past, when the forces of the world were gathered into a mighty storm, 
there was a message, a mighty message given to humanity and embodied in imperishable symbols. All the kingdoms of the earth gave to this great mystery something of their forces and experience. Out of the earth rose great animals, strong and mighty to labor. They lived and died, and while forgotten, they left behind a force which was strength and power and endurance. This formed the hind part of the great mystery. Upon this, like a mighty thing, it crouches, lying down in patience, resting in powerful strength. Subject to the mighty dictates of the law of time, waiting for the hour to strike when the power and strength and patience shall be utilized. That mighty image of eternal creations shall rise on its shoulders, Powerful wings are spread, for out of the air, like great birds soaring in the heavens, comes the force which we know as the awful longing to penetrate beyond the clouds, to explore the heights, to bring back an answer from the invisible portals of eternity. It is this unanswerable longing that is forever expressed in the outstretched, outstretched wings on its forepart or breast as of a woman symbol of the force which goes ever on and on ever feeding ever bringing forth patiently giving and waiting waiting for the end that when those creatures she has suckled shall become the lords of creation and the cry goes forth oh the force of mother love oh eternal nourisher who hath poured forth a never-ending stream of life, feeding the children of men, how long, how long shall it endure until men awakens and stands upon his feet? This great mystery has the head of a lion, and in its eyes the light of the darning, darring and fortitude. The eyes are those of a human soul looking out, searching the four quarters of the earth, looking, waiting, watching. Today, the same as yesterday, the same puny creatures calling themselves men and women with the same selfish traits, the same animal instincts to kill and render and tear, and forever the same godlike forces struggling for birth within them. Yet the eternal patience waits. O generations of pygmies, how long shall it be ere er, I trample ye with my lion's feet and with my lion's mouth rend ye limb from limb? External justice demands your extinction, O bestial creatures who call yourselves kings of the earth. And yet back of it all and crowning its head is the kingly cap, the urus, the diadem of the king of kings. In those eyes, so strong and fixed, is the look of unmutable love and hope and cheer. Looking always into the future, seeing innumerable sunrise and go down in blood red fire, yet always waiting for the coming day. Oh, love divine, how long must ye wait? How many hearts must break with longing ere thy force conquers the evil in the world? This is thy message to the children of men. Too long has the world grown under perverted falsehoods calling themselves religions. Too long has priestcraft held mankind by the throat with lion's claws and lapped their blood. Draw near to the front of life. Drink from the paps of mother's love. Draw great nourishing drafts of life and be not discouraged. Ye are not a stone image blindingly crying out. Age after age, the great story of man's redemption. Ye forget that ye are living, breathing vital forces with the power to act. Ye too have stood on Egypt's sands and have given your life for the great cause, 
have been born again and again, struggled, hoped, despaired, and laid down your lives with trust in the great law. Yet always as life departed, the vision of reality is held before you. There is an end to all things mundane, an end to long continued waiting. I have waited through the ages and crumbled not, neither decay, because I symbolize to man this eternal waiting for the fullness of time, ever looking toward the light and knowing that it will come. Help mankind to see the light. Helped him to shackle off the shackles of superstition and priestcraft. Helped him to stand alone in the desert of human existence and look only toward the rising sun. All things manifest in cycles and it has been born in, on my stony heart that the time is almost come. The great cycle of time has almost run its course. There is a sacred scroll on which are the calculations of the incarnations which must be passed ere the deliverance comes. And since in ancient Egypt, the first recognition of the great mystery was recorded in imperishable stone, so shall it be there fulfilled. And she who come and want shall come again. And the spirit of truth shall come once more be taught. The night is almost done and Egypt shall once more live in all her splendor and greatness as your, not an earthly greatness, but a spiritual illumination through the manifestations of the eternal truths. <laughs> well, the Sphinx is damn smart. It's true. I mean, we've been waiting and waiting, and we're like, oh, it's the Great Awakening. Hi, everybody. We're waking up. Hi. We're waking up, all right. And it ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. The curtain. A child of light came down as a brooding spirit and was buried in the heart of the darkness. It parted the curtain of darkness with tiny hands of flame. Then it became a glowing eye. And the eye smiled, and the eye sent thrilling, life-giving forces through the darkness of the heart that was being born. O oh, little flame, within the dense darkness of my undeveloped heart, help me to fix my gaze upon thee, Help me to see the tiny flames which are thy hands, pushing back the darkness of ignorance, glowing, brightening, illumining, shining, shining behind the curtain that hides the other side. A little flame, spirit of light, as I sit and gaze, the curtain thins, opens, and I see thine eye, and the eye begins to smile at me through the curtain. Love. Love, oh, love divine, where art thou? What is this dark curtain that hides thee from my gaze? A small, still small voice replies, the curtain is the love of self and, it, and into its meshes are woven the dark threads of personal opinion, its warp and wolf, Woven in and out the loom of time are made up of so many, many threads. Yet back of it, I see the little flame playing, lighting and illumining. Must my tired fingers unravel thread by thread all this heavy curtain? It has taken me so many weary ages to weave it. Look, look into it. I have woven so many beautiful pictures of the past. Pictures of ambition, of desire for adultation, yet in many efforts to uplift humanity. Must these to be unraveled? See, if I rip out these threads, my heart's blood will flow. For with them I see so cunningly devised all that I hold most dear. My intellect, what... <clears throat> 
scintillating beams of light like jewels it has woven into the curtain. Beloved child of the flame, canest thou not look through the curtain of my life and let thy beams loom into dark into brightness? It is so great, so strong, so beautiful. I and I love it. I love it. Come from behind, it folds that I may see thee, bright shining child. Be to it a beacon of fire that the beauty of this curtain may shine forth more perfectly. Let thy light make this curtain that I have woven through the ages more illumined and bright that the world may see its beauty for it hangs before the Holy of Holies. It drapes the altar of the Most High. O oh, holy flame, why dost thou flicker and die? Why dost thou cease the brilliant shining? Come back, come back. For without thy shining, my tapestry of life fades into darkness. See its brilliant colorings. See its wondrous designs. A little flame of life shine upon it with the brightness. Bless it with thy presence. No, no. The light grows dim. Thy brilliant eye looks sad. Thy presence seems to recede deeper into the blackness of night. Ah, me. I must watch and wait. I must pray before the altar night and day. Then sometime thou wilt come back. Sometime thy bright shining will again appear. O flame of love divine, O eye of infinity. Once I caught a glimpse of thy bright shining and thou art gone. Why should this be? Where is my beautiful tapestry? How can I see its glorious jewels and its wondrous colorings? How can the world discern it? It seems lost in the darkness of eternal night. Is this dark, is this divine justice? That I should work and strive and weave and toil and hang before the altar of the Most High this tapestry of my life, only to have the darkness hide it. O oh, love divine, one little spark of thy shining, one little thrill of thy coming. Without thy light, all I have done is lost. Without thy shining, all is dark. Methinks I slept and dreamt. And behold, in my dream, I no longer saw the wondrous curtain of my weaving. Instead, I saw an altar built of precious jewels. And besides it stood one all glory and brightness. And as I knelt before his feet, and I cried out with very ecstasy of joy. And then slowly my curtain fell between us. But what is this? What is this? Again, the little child of light springs up. It is the jewel of fire whose tiny hands of flame are reaching out. There is the glowing eye that laughs in my face, yet it wears a countenance of plenitive joy. And now I see it reach out its arms of flame and touch the folds of my tapestry. How beautifully it is illumined. The flames grasp it in their arms and it hug it, up, hug it close. But they twist and shout and laugh for joy as they lick up and consume this curtain that I wrought so cunningly. Let it burn, let it burn. For it is the flame of love divine that consumes it. O love divine, O radiant presence, thou art still there. My curtain that I made, that I, even I toiled and contrived and wove and build, is gone. The flame of love has consumed it. Only thy presence now left undimmed and clear. Only that remains. Very, very deep. The young aviator returns. We started off with this, sorry guys. Um, the story, and it was cut off and now it's continuing. And this is by Dr. and Mrs. F. Homer Curtis. So it is by the authors. Again, Miss Curtis is a channel. So she's channeling this stuff. 
During an interview with The Young Aviator, which was published in Azoth for September 1918, he promised to play fair. And if he found we were correct in telling him that there was no death to a mortal soul, and that change called death is but the taking off of a dense outer garment of flesh, he would return and admit that we were right. <laughs> and he has kept his word. <laughs> Although this article was not presented as being evidential from strictly scientific standpoint, but merely as an amusing and interesting incident, it was nevertheless sincerely criticized in a light in a little in a certain little sheet because it contained nothing but its own internal evidence as to being veridical. The criticism was unfair and bitter in its sarcasm and ridicule, especially in reference to the statement that the young aviator expected to study the models of the ancient Atlantean aeroplanes in the Pattern Museum of the Astral World and endeavor through this study to help his country to win supremacy of the air. Although the statement was ridiculed as a raving of unbalanced imagination on the part of the authors, we had not deemed it worthy of reply, but on Sunday afternoon, January 5th, 1919, the young aviator again appeared to Miss Curtis, this time in a highly indignant frame of mind. He insisted that he was the one whose veracity had been impunged and whose powers of accurate observation had been slurred Hence, he wished to vindicate the criticized statement. We therefore give here with the substance of our talk with him, lasting from 5 p.m. until 6 p.m., as reported by Miss Curtis, while in full walking, waking consciousness, according to the independent or telepathic method. It is not present as scientifically evidential, but it was intensely interesting to us, and we think it would be most readers of Azov. They are perfect liberty not to take our world word as it its source as to its source. If the message itself is not sufficient evidence and we will not be offended if those who cannot respond to its truth lay it to our disorder imagination. We simply comply with the young aviator's request to transmit the message as he gave it to us. How do you do, Miss Dr. Curtis? I've been to see you a number of times, but you have always been in such a rush of work that I didn't like it, like to butt in. <clears throat> I have also attended a number of your lectures and have also studied over here and have learned a lot since I first met you. My, but I was ignorant then, but I'm glad you have time to listen now because this is important. I especially want to tell you that critic that all you said in that last article is true, for I have not only been admitted to the Pattern Museum and have studied the Atlantean aeroplane models, but I have come back and put across what I have learned, although not in the way I then expected. And the U.S. government is today building new types of aeroplanes, embodying the new ideas I've been able to grasp and transmit. Already, a plane has been announced that made 145 miles an hour on its trial flight, and another that carries 60 people. A Thanksgiving dinner was served to five people in another while 2,000 feet up. Um, Soon you will hear of improvements far beyond anything known when I was down there, both as regards warplanes and especially planes, which will make regular passage travel as safe and commonplace as Pullman cars. You see, I found out that when a man thinks definitely along a certain line, there is a stream of force goes out from his brain that makes a pathway out into space. If he thinks clearly, the path leads up through the realms and worlds, for I have found that there are many worlds over here 
besides the astral world in which I'm working up to the ideal or pattern that his thought is reaching out toward. I've followed up lots of these paths since I've been over here just to see where they would lead. And although many of them start out bright and clear, nearly all just end up in a jungle or only blind alleys that get you nowhere. But the paths that go out from minds of trained thinkers to lead to definite ends and bring back to those minds definite realizations or attainments. Once in a while, I found a mind like this big line with nothing there, whose path seems to go straight on upward and on and on through all the worlds as far as I could see. And in each world, it seems to spread out and make connections and make itself at home. Such a mind can bring back to its brain truth from every world it contacts. For I've followed it far enough to know that what you said about life over here is true. My father's got a mind like that too. Oh, the path that goes out from his brain is big and broad and clear and light. I certainly have a wonderful dad. It's not occupied with philosophy and symbols and religious things like yours, but it's full of wonderful ways of helping humanity, of uplifting the people and improving conditions so they'll be better citizens. And he's got wonderful plans for our country too, for making it the greatest and best and most helpful, wonderful country in the whole world. These paths are all bright and clear, but they only go a little ways. For back of each one, there seems to stand a shrouded figure with a sickle in its hand, and it cuts them off before they finished. Poor dad. I'm afraid he'll not last to see his great ideas fulfilled, for he's a broken man. He's like a great lion that's been put in a cage and beaten and prodded and half starved. His spirit is not broken but his body is. And so all he can do is roar defiance. The fact that the, the fact is that dad spends almost much as much time over here with me now as he does with you down there. And every time I can get off from my work, I go to him and tell him all about it. I'm going to put a little pause there. Again, I'm reading this with you guys. I didn't read this beforehand. And something that pops up in my interest, my peak of interest, is the fact that before my father passed away, and I wasn't as spiritually, oh, well, I'm always a spiritually awakened, but I didn't have the knowledge that I do now. And I was much younger and in hell. I believe that my father was in between two worlds, just like my mother was. Right before my dad died, he started talking about all the dead people on the other side and how he saw them. And, you know, he didn't, he knew that I wouldn't get scared or not believe him because he knew what I was. My mother, the same thing. She started seeing things that I see. She never saw them before and she would freak the hell out and tell me like she never let me light sage in my house ever. And then one night she saw a shadow figure walking up the stairs, thought it was me. Nope, I'm in bed sleeping. And she freaked out and she then allowed me to sage the house. <laughs> but she would have never saw those things if she wasn't in her on her way out. The body transitions its soul to get ready to find its way upstairs. And I feel the same way is happening in better description here with the aviator's father. Let's get back. You said, doctor, that more than a year ago, your teacher, oh yes, I met your teacher over here, but I don't get much time to study those things just now told you that my dad was going to sit with the Peace Council and have great influence in shaping its policies. 
when he wasn't appointed, you thought perhaps you'd got things twisted or there had been some mistake. But you were told then that even though he wasn't officially appointed, there couldn't they couldn't keep him away. And it did look like it when he planned to visit the place where they buried my body over in France. But I want to tell you that your teacher was right after all. He'll be at the peace conference, all right, but he may not be there in just the way you thought. I could see that he's not going to be with you long, but I don't want to want you to mention this as long as he is there. But that thought in the minds of a lot of people would tend to push him over here a little sooner. And when he comes over here, But I started out to tell the critic how I put across the new ideas I get from my studies up here in the museum. In the first place, everyone is not admitted to it any more than anyone is admitted to a Masonic library in Washington. Only those qualified. <laughs> The Bosch aviators over here want to get in too, but as they never invented much of anything, only copied others, and as they are still working for Deutschland, Uber Allies, they are not permitted near the, the place. Also, those who are merely curious are barred. In fact, there's just two classes who are admitted, those of us over here who are interested in making flying safer and more useful for mankind and those on earth whose taught thought streams makes a straight clear path right up to those patterns. And I'm told, although I don't know this myself, that even so they would be prevented from entering until the hour had struck when human evolution had reached a point where it would be best for it to have such inventions. And many more wonderful things are awaiting for the years to come until those who have charge up here keep the doors closed. Now there's a bunch of us boys up here who've given up our lives to perfecting a flying, not merely giving them up down there, but up here too, for we are devoting ourselves to it for a good of mankind and having lost our lives in your world because of their deficiencies, we're going to find out how to make them safer. So when we learn something new about them, we have to go to some of the inventors whose minds are sending out st steady streams of thought toward flying. You see, I couldn't explain an improvement in the engine to Miss Curtis. Even if I showed her every part and exactly how they worked, she couldn't explain to a mechanist how to make it. She hasn't the kind of mind her pathways of light don't run toward the idea of flying. So we have to find those who are studying flying, and if they are sensitive enough, we suggest the new improvement to give them by impressing our idea upon them. And some of them get the idea more or less clearly, at least they make some changes in the old type. Of course, they don't know they are being given the idea by us. They just think they thought it out by themselves or they say it suddenly came to me. <laughs> Although some are conscious that they got help from somewhere in some way. <laughs> with others we are just a picture or a model of improvement in their thought pathway and let their thought stream play it all over and pretty soon they say i see it i've got the idea now and so they have some of them see it well over here in sleep and think they dreamed it all up but anyway we are getting the improvements over as fast as the minds of the inventors can grasp them. Tell the critic that I haven't been able to understand the engine that gives its power from the air yet, 
but I'm studying it. And when I get it, I'll put that over too. By the way, doctor, I may not be telling you anything new, but I found that there are places over here where they keep other kinds of ideas. There is one where they keep all the laws man has ever made and were all the plans of the great statesman for the betterment of humanity and the improvement of its institutions and conditions are perfected and then stored up until some mind can reach up and grasp them. And the time is ripe to bring them down to earth. I don't know as you would call this a museum, but it's some kind of place like a state house or forum or academy of something like that. And only the great statesmen and rulers of the past can go in there. Also the minds of the great statesmen on earth today, which make straight paths to it. You know, when my dad comes over here, he'll walk right in because he belongs there. My dad certainly is a wonder. You know, he used to be Okay, this is a jaw-dropping moment. Jaw drop! Jaw drop! You know, he used to be Julius Caesar in a past life. But when he, oh shit. <laughs> but when he comes over here, they're not going to call him that anymore. They're going to call him as he's called on earth now because they say over here that his present incarnation is a greater one than that of Caesar. So they are going to call him who I was, who was I in those days. Well, I'm ashamed to tell you, just call me father's son. But Miss Curtis has guessed it. You can see that what I did to him in that life, that I might rule in his steed, has prevented me from succeeding him in this life. And I thought I was doing the right thing then too. I was not that I loved Caesar less, but that I loved Rome more. Well, this story just took a huge ass twist. Holy shit. I'm going to put another pause there. Do you see what happens? How we all in a group, tribe, family, soul family, right? You got, you got your family and then you got your outer little branches and your outer little branches. Do you see what happens? That dude, the aviator, was at fault for killing Caesar, who happened to be his dad in that in lifetime that he lived. Do you see how that like it's a reciprocation? It's a it's a reciprocal thing. It's a cycle. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be a famous person or somebody who's been in a, a, a horror in a past. We've all been good and bad in our in our past lives. And many of the lives that we've incarnated into are just mundane, plain lives. But here's a really prime example of how you work with certain people and these people show up again and again and again and again and again because each lifetime you all change your roles for each other so you can learn. It's an agreement you make together. Moving on. And as he knows all the great statesmen on earth today, when he gets over here, just as he would hammer home fundamental truths and principles, and put them over on earth. So when he gets here, he will be able to hammer into the minds of all the living statesmen whose minds are all open to his suggestions. The perfected ideas for this, for the good of mankind, which he will find ready in the statesman's hall. So you see, he may be powerful influence at the peace conference after all. Well, so long. 
I must run over and see how dad is getting along. But be sure to tell that critic that he, that we are putting cr across things of practical value to mankind at all the time. The trouble with him is that he is not able to recognize them or understand where they come from because his mind path doesn't run in the right direction. So let's just kind of recap here what they're, what those stories in essence before we move on is talking about. Huge. This is like what my parents are doing for me in, in not in such a, I'm going to have the biggest impact on humanity kind of way, because let's get, let's get that real here. No, not because I don't want to, not because I don't want to help humanity. My role is huge in many ways, but that's helping other people see what they are and who they are here. My parents are doing the same thing the aviator is doing. They're sending me streams of information. And so are probably whoever is working with me. And the same with all of you, you get these aha moments, you get these little signs and symbols of things that you need to do or read, or you get an epiphany and it's like mind blowing and game changing for you. These are not your thoughts. This is coming from upstairs. They're giving you this information. Your higher self is working with them. We you're, you're, that just proves right there in many ways, my parents are always with me in energy. I can always call them. And then if I need to know it's them, the last two things I did with my father was he held my hand and he makes me cry because that was the last moment I had with him before he died. I held his hand and he woke up out of a coma to cry because I told him to go home. And that next morning he did. My mother, the same thing. I knew she was going to die. I felt something sucked the life out of me. I started seeing fucking everything in astral in the hospital. I held her hand until she went. And I had to clear her dead because they were morons in that hospital so i get two types of feelings i get this warm calm rush over my body and i feel my hand being held in the scene with my father but he makes me cry so i know there's a two distinctions so i mean so many people Talk about, oh, I got this radio station. It makes me think about my friend that passed away or my, you know, parent that passed away. They come all the time. They're around you all the time. You just have to, again, he's talking about the straight pathways to whatever you're interested in or doing. You have to have a clear state of mind and good for humanity and you can reach those things. I don't necessarily think he's talking about the Akashic Records. I'm kind of not doubting the Akashic Records because I know they do exist, but I don't necessarily believe when you go there or someone reads that for you, it's giving you just one bit of timeline that you might move away from. You can always look up your past and to see who you were. Not that that should, I mean, like, that dude was fucking Julius Caesar. His dad was Julius Caesar. That's awesome. In the great scheme of things, his soul needed that experience. So he was Caesar. Great. And now he reincarnated into this dude. And maybe this life that that guy was living, he wanted to do better for humanity. 
again, it's all an experience that we need to learn from. That just was like mind blowing though. That's really cool. Whoever that aviator was in his past life, he could have been Augustus. Who knows? How cool though is that? I mean, between Lincoln and this, pretty amazing. Sadly, this is the last, it's not a chapter, it's just the last of the book from what I think. Some Fundamentals in the Psychology of Narcotic Drug Addiction. It happens to be in this book, so it has to be something important. Foundation of Order of Christian Mystics or Authors of the Curtis Books. Read before the World Conference on Narcotic Education, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, July 6th, 1926, by Dr. F. Homer Curtis, Chairman of the Committee of Psychology. Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen of the conference, yesterday this conference was thrilled by the recital of the many historic documents, organizations, and movements with which had been inaugurated in Philadelphia. But to me, in addition to all these things, there is a great special personal thrill in being present at the inauguration of this conference in the city of Florida. For it was in Philadelphia that the Order of the Christian Mystics, which we have the honor to represent, was founded. And it was also here that I acquired my medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania, my wife and my religion. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if you and the conference will pardon a personal reference, I would like to relate a personal reminiscence for it seems to me that this conference stands in a similar position to that in which we stood many years ago. And the happy result of the way our situation unfolded may be of encouragement to the members of this conference. More than 20 years ago, Mrs. Curtis and I were told to prepare ourselves to launch a worldwide spiritual movement presenting a cosmic philosophy which would give a rational explanation to all experiences of life both here and thereafter. At that time, this seemed impossible, hopeless. Naturally, we all thought that in the course of five or perhaps 10 years of intense study, we might possibly be ready to begin on a work of such magnitude. But when after only one year's preparation, we were suddenly told it's time to begin the work, we were aghast. At that time, Mrs. Curtis was employed as private se secretary to the president of a large business concern. I was in my junior year of medical school at the University of Pennsylvania and instructor in the university and an active officer in a number of clubs and organizations, both within and outside the university. So I said, how in the world can we begin that work? We have no time, no money, no prestige, no special ability, and we are unknown to the world. What can we do to start the work? The answer was get a pencil and a piece of paper. And that evening there was written the first announcement to the world of the Order of Christian Mystics. And it is still in use today as the first page of the pamphlet explaining the work of the order. It seems to me, therefore, Mr. Chairman and ladies and gentlemen, that this conference today stands in a somewhat similar position and has been given the vision. It has answered the call. It has come with its pencil and its piece of paper, its program. And I venture to predict that the document, its constitution and proceedings, which it will write at this time, will be its guide and inspiration for many years to come. For just as that half dozen earnest students gathered together in this city 20 years ago, conscious of the source of their inspiration, with faith in their mission, with the courage of their convictions, unselfish in their desire for the enlightenment of humanity, 
and strong in a childlike confidence in their ultimate success have seen their work grow from the first single sheet into 13 large volumes of teachings, all of which have run through many editions and from a handful of students in this city until today, there is not a civilized country on the face of the earth, including the native blacks in every country of West Africa from Morocco all the way down to Cape Town that is not represented. So many of this conference expected similar results for it is following the same laws of growth. Yesterday, our secretary general told us that this was the king's business. And let me assure you that those who are on the king's business shall not fail to receive their credentials from him. And if they look to him as the source of their power and authority, they shall not fail to receive his help, his power, his inspiration, and his love. Let us then plant the seed thoughts of our mission in the minds of all people, water them with our prayers, nourish them with our faith, and cultivate them with unselfish service. And I can assure you from personal experience that the Lord of the harvest will take care of the increase. And so I say to this conference, no matter what the opposition and disappointments, follow your ideals and sail on, sail on. Before beginning my paper, I wish to make a slight correction. From the program, it may seem that I prepared this paper all by myself, but such is not the case, since this planet and its humanity have recently entered upon a great cycle of a new Aquarian or woman's age. It is especially fitting and a great pleasure for me to acknowledge the help, the collaboration and inspiration of my wife, Harriet Augusta Curtis who with me working as one is the co-founder of the Order of Christian Mystics and the co-author of the entire series of the Curtis books. I now have the great privilege of presenting for you consideration some fundamentals in psychology of drug addiction. The mind of man is the instrument of his salvation, not the cause, only the instrument, but his salvation depends upon the extent to which he understands the laws of mind and uses them wisely. Back in the childhood days of modern psychology, before the development of psycho psychiatrical research, it used to be taught that thought was a secretion of the brain, much as bile is a secretion of the liver. There was back in the days of purely materialistic and philosophical psychology that were taught that we think with our brains. As a result of modern research, we now know paradoxical, as it may seem, that we do not think with our brains, but with our minds, which is quite a different thing for psychological research has proved that mind is the avenue through which the consciousness functions and this function quite independent of the brain. The brain being but the mechanism which has to do with the expression on earth of the thought formulated in the consciousness. This is an important advance over the now almost obsolete teaching of the old school materialists in psychology that thought was impossible without the brain. Being such a conception is only natural to those who are not familiar with the latest advances along these lines. So with your permission, I would like to take a moment or two to refresh your minds as to certain recently ascertained fundamentals in this science that I may the more easily point out their application to the problem of narcotic drug addiction. No thought in the mind of man can find expression here except through muscular contraction. The use of the vocal apparatus of the hand, the facial expression, a look, a shrug, all take place as a result of muscular contraction. In this respect, the brain is but the switchboard by which an idea of current of thought, not in the brain, but in the mind, contracts the body and stimulates those centers of muscular contraction, which will give it proper expression in the physical world, pushes the button as it were. The classical example in medical history of a laborer who, through a premature blast, had a crowbar driven up 
through the frontal lobes of the brain and survived without loss of his mental faculties. It is evidence of this. For although he lost many ounces of actual brain tissue, the motor areas were not injured and so were able to function and express his thoughts. For generations, the mystery of how thought was translated into action of how a thing so ethereal and intangible as thought could make contact with and find expression through so concrete and physical an instrument as the body remain a mystery to medical science and psychi psychologists of the Western world, although it was well known for ages to more profound psychologists and philosophers of the Far East. Modern researchers have now confirmed the scientifically proven the Eastern teachings so that we now know the literal thoughts are things, real, tangible, definitely formed objects composed of the substance of the mental world. In fact, they are so concrete that they can register themselves upon a photographic plate by their own inherent radiant energy and quite independent of any form of light. Naturally, it would be a misnomer to call the resulting pictures th thought, pi thought photographs as they are not photographs since no form of photos or light were used. Therefore, the term scotograph had been coined to fit the case. For generations, the mystery of how thought was translated into action of how thing how a thing so ethereal and intangible as thought could make contact with and find expression through, so concrete and physical an instrument as the body remained a mystery to medical science and the psychiatrists of the Western world, although it was known for ages as to the more profound psychologists and philosophers of the East. Did I not read this already? I did. What happens when I have to pause? Moving forward, I myself have had the pleasure of seeing the original plate which record recorded the first scotograph or thought form when Mr. when Dr. Baradou of Paris first conceived the idea be immediately experimented. He concentrated his gaze intently upon his walking stick for several minutes until he could close his eyes and visualize it clearly. He then turned to his dark room where he exposed an ordinary photograph plate in absolute darkness and gazed at it fixedly while concentrating his mind on the walking stick and visualizing it intensely. When his concentration began to tire, he stopped and developed the plate. And there was a picture of the walking stick clearly imprinted and surrounded by a slight halo of radiant energy. After this experiment, which, on, which any one with strongly developed powers of concentration and visualization could duplicate, unlimitedly hundreds of others were made until it now scientifically well established that every thought we think actually creates an objective, although invisible to the naked eye, form composed of mental molecules called mentoids these thought forms are clear or vague in outline according as the concept held in the mind is clear or vague they are strong and positive or dim and weak according to the strength of the desire or the character of thought that creates them they have formed characteristic of an idea which fashions them and even impregnate the photographic film with their characteristic color, the colors varying with the state of the emotions, the health, etc. And I have seen those colors not placed on the film, but Im embedded within its substance. They also have their rates of vibration and even sound. Their keynote, although is not audible to the ordinary ear. These thought forms are charged with a form of radiant energy according to the thought force and willpower used in their production. All this has been demonstrated not only in the thousands of experiments of Dr. Brow Baraduk and his followers, but also in quite another field, that of psychic research. So powerfully radioactive are those thought forms that their formative activity can affect not only the photographic plate or film, but also the newly discovered semi-physical, semi astral biologic plasma called ectoplasma which 
certainly relatively rare in, in rare individuals endow with the special development of their etheric and astral bodies are capable of extruding from their physical bodies. This ectoplasmum first emanates as a vapory cloud, but after slight contact with the air condenses into a semi-solid, cold and clammy, jelly-like mass, which has been weighed, measured, and photographed before a moving picture camera and submitted to biological and micro scopical analysis. All this is familiar to advanced students of psychic research. But the point to be noted in this connection is that the creative power of thought and radioactive emanations of thought forms can mold or impress upon the plastic ectoplasm of any form or thought held in the minds of those present. This has been amply demonstrated in hundreds of experiments in private psychological laboratories under the most exacting and rigidly scientific test conditions, many actual photographs of which can be seen in Dr. von Schrinnick Nutzing's phenomena of materialization, also in the form, also in From the Unconscious to the Conscious by Dr. Gustav Geely, the late director of the Institute Metaphysic Metapsychic of Paris in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Case of the Case for Spiritual Photography in Dr. Coates Photographing the Invisible. These thought forms can also act upon solutions of certain special, specially prepared mineral salts as to cause the form to crystallize out of the solution in a semi- solid mass of mineral deposits as described by Dr. Charles W. Littlefield in his book, The Beginning and Way of Life. For countless ages, it has been a common thing for mankind to use such expressions as currents of thought, prevailing ideas, trains of thought, an idea suddenly struck me. Now we can see not only the truth of these expressions, but their rationale and scientific explanation for these thought forms once created and launched into atmosphere of the mental world naturally tend through a law analogous to the law of chemical affinity, the law of mental affinity, together together with other thought forms of like character and vibratory rate. These aggregations of mass thought are capable of exercising terrific dynamic power varying with their constitution as it is seen in their generally destructive effect in the so-called mob psychology and crowd hysteria, which is capable of sweeping people into ferocious expressions of prejudice, hate, and passion without regard to law or reason and quite opposite to the normal thoughts and desires of the same individuals when not under the obsession of such thought aggregates. The constructive side of the same law of mass thought is seen not only in religious services and mass prayer action in which spiritual forces are involved to vitalize and make more powerful the thought forces, but is also seen around public opinion, so-called, but which is simply the aggregation of sim similar thought forms directed toward a definite end. Its compelling action is so great that it can quickly settle a coal strike or even the recent great general strike in England. The constructive thought forms generated for the common good, neutralizing and finally overpowering the personal and selfish thought forms of individuals or smaller groups. The gradual aggregation of the thought forms of both temperance and women's suffrage generated at first by a handful of altruistic and far-seeing souls, but persistently repeated and endowed with positive will and great spiritual power at last swept the whole nation and finally amended the constitution of the United States during the world war after the order of Christian mystics had been inaugurated a worldwide noonday prayer service for peace among its pupils throughout the world. The idea was taken up by many churches and other organizations and within a few weeks, the lustful war and the will to fight of the central powers was neutralized and overcome by the will for peace, thus consciously generated. The central powers then made overturn for armistic, not because they could not fight, have fought, 
on for months or for as guns, ammunition, and supplies were concerned, but because of a so-called loss of morale, both in the ranks and at home. This was a purely psychological reaction, but which produced a concrete result which saved millions of humans' lives and reshaped history and human destiny. Even so, must we apply this law of mass law action to this terribly menacing problem of drug addiction, the so-called campaign of education which this conference is organized to promote is nothing less than a plea consciously to generate in mass at least two generic thought forms, one, the danger of the use of narcotic drugs, the other, abolition of possibility of obtaining them. But if we have an understanding of this type of law of mass, thought creation and projection, we can work more consciously, intelligently, and efficiently toward its consummation and generate thought forms and thought currents with which power is the aggregate that they shall sweep the country and demand and command their expression and enforcement. Indeed, it is not outside the bounds of possibility to procure a constitutional amendment in this country and the adoption of universal abolition of narcotic drugs by all the people of mankind. Another point of importance is the connection. The mind of man is enormously open to suggestion. We may lay it down as a fundamental law of psychology that every thought we think or accept as ours sooner or later tends to express itself in action through us unless counteracted by an opposite thought of greater power. Many, many thoughts and suggestions pop into our minds that are not ours at all, created by others and floating around the thought currents of the community. They drift into our minds when they are in a relaxed or idle state, the doors of our minds swinging idly on their hinges, as it were, or because of affinity or similarity of vibrations to our own. But if we accept these outside thoughts, take them in and contemplate them, we have deliberately made them our own and given them power over us. For other fundamental law of psychology is that every thought that we contemplate or repeat, we feed and give power over us. Therefore, a feature of the educational work, which this conference is to inaugurate, should be te to be teach the people of the world, especially its youth, the laws of suggestion, that they must be on their guard against all suggestions and accept none without conscious scrutiny to see if it is in harmony with their ideals and standards of life before consciously adopting it and making it their own. For we are mentally and morally and even legally responsible not only for our acts and words, but for every thought to which we give expression. They must be taught to recognize that any suggestion which tends to influence them to violate the law, the moral code and their ideals and standards of life is vicious and should be immediately counteracted by the strongest possible assertion to an opposite thought. They will thus recognize that the suggestion of the drug peddler, that they take a sniff or a shot to get a thrill, to be a sport or try anything once is not a casual and friendly suggestion or even a harmless dare, but is a coldly calculated and deliberate stab in the back, a deliberate attempt to break down their natural psychic immunity solely for the sordid money there is in it. Far better take a dare than embrace a devil. The above is the general application of psychological laws to this problem but there are many personal applications of which I will outline but one. But just as the specialist in science will baffle by problems in the known range of his specialty, must preserve an open mind and be willing to go outside the orthodox limits and go into unknown fields if necessary, grapple with entirely new concepts and be ready to accept truth wherever found. If his science is to advance and not get into a rut, so must we in the consideration of this problem of narcotic drug addiction. I therefore trust that you will bear with me in patience for a few minutes while I enter upon a subject outside the narrowly materialistic lines to which this problem is usually confound, a subject which such a wide spreading and to many obscure and taboo specialty that reference it 
may arouse a certain amount of incre incredulity. I can't get that word up or even opposition in the minds of those who have not given the subject special thought or whose minds may be prejudiced by early training in materialistic conceptions of life or by the remnants of certain medieval superstitions. After proving the concrete and objective reality of thought forms, even though as invisible as a gas or an electron, the next step was proof that the, these thought forms could be projected to register upon the mind properly attuned to the mind of the sender and without regard to distance. This direct transfer of thought from mind to mind without any means of physical expression or communication is called tele telepathy. The proof of this power has been abundantly set forth in the classical volume F. W. H. Myers, The Human Personality in Phantasms of the Living by Gurney Myers and Podmore, and by many more, many later investigators, some of whom had had a high as 78% accurate results. The next step after proving possible the direct and independent communication of mind with mind was a reveal that this law operated no matter what the environment of the mind, that is, whether the mind was embodied or disembodied. Beside the classical works referred to above, there are many later volumes packed with such a mass of evidence and proof of this that is now scarcely open to discussion in, in well-informed circles. My new point, therefore, is that just as the mind of those embodied here on earth can create and project thought forms and also receive them, so can the disembodied mind of the X incarnate create and project and receive thought forms. This they can do far more easily and with greater power than the incarnate because not hampered by the inertia of physical instrument of expression, the body of flesh. Also for the inertia of the mass thought of humanity on any subject as well, the tendency of rational mind to argue it out before being able to accept a new idea. Modern research has abundantly and scientifically proved through photography, telekinesis, cross correspondence, book tests, that so-called death applies to the physical instrument or body only and not to the mind or the personality, the essential individual or soul. So-called death is but a slipping off of an outer garment, a coat of flesh, the personality thereby being released from its hampering conditions and limitations and becoming not a bright and shining all perfect angel, but remaining also exactly as it was before, except that it is not hampered by the physical instrument so necessary to relate its consciousness to the physical world. That mind and consciousness does survive and it's capable of giving vertical proof of its identity and continued existence. It's proved by its ability to mold it and ex extra exudic never saw that word in my life of ectoplasm into uh another word i can't pronounce of its former physical body so perfect as to be easily recognized by its surviving friends and in some cases which i have seen to complete that it can be temporarily inhabited by the disincarnate personality and be used to walk talk audibly in its characteristic tone of voice move physical objects and otherwise manifest conclusively prove its identity and its relatively unchanged mental and other personal idiosyncrasies this being the case and volumes of evidence made under scientific test conditions place the subject almost out of the realm of controversy except as to details it is now being a simple question of amount of information or a lack of information one has on the subject. The person departs from this physical world with any strong earthly or bodily desire, unsatisfied naturally seeks every possible avenue through which to gratify that desire. And if it is a desire which can be gratified only in the physical world, it naturally seeks an instrument or physical body through which it can obtain such gratification. This desire is for renewed physical expression, holds such minds close to the physical world in what may be called the 
slums of the ethereal or astral world, which is the world just beyond and an octave higher in vibration than the physical world. The disincarnate personalities thus held close to the earth by their desires and thoughts constitute what are called the earth bound, while those not so held by earthly desires naturally and unconsciously rise into the higher, finer, and brighter realms of manifestation according to the law of spiritual gravity. To obtain the desired expression in the physical, the disembodied one must find some person whose body and mind are abnormally open to such suggestions, impressions, and thought transferences to the point at least partial possession or obsession. Such persons are found under the mentally unstable, the neuroacentic, and especially among the alcoholics and narcotic drug abuse addicts, addicts. I use the word abnormally open to such impressions advisedly for the very good reason that just as the majority of humanity are protected from the invasion of infectious diseases by a natural physical immunity until that immunity is broken down by fatigue destructive emotions abnormal living just as it is the mind of man protected from the invasion of psychic suggestion and thought forms from the invisible worlds by a natural psychic immunity Therefore, let no normal mind fear psychic invasion. We all possess an ethereal and astral body as a substratum or model into the meshes of which the physical body is built. And between this finer body and the physical body, there is a special layer of etheric matter, which normally prevents vibrations and thought forces from the unseen world from reacting and registering upon our physical body. But this protective and immunity conferring layer is dissolved by alcohol and is paralyzed and rapidly disintegrated by narcotic drugs, thus exposing the addict to obsession from the invisible, just as one whose physical immunity is destroyed is opened by infection by invisible pathogenic bacteria. <clears throat> the alcohol radical of all the higher alcohols, meth methyl, enthyl, propyl, butyl, is really an ethereal substance, normally belonging to the ethereal world, but temporarily materialized in the physical. When its bond to the physical are released and naturally tends to fly back into the world, an octave of vibration to which it normally belongs. In the alcoholic, it passes into the ethereal world through certain outlets or centers which connect the physical with the astral, and in doing so, it dissolves the ethereal wall, which normally confers psychic immunity and thus exposes the victim to all the horrors to be found in the alums of the astral world. The horrid visions of delirium, tremens, are therefore not the mere ravings of disordered imagination, but actual sights of very real things in the astral world. The narcotic radical in drugs acts in a similar manner exposing its victims not only to his own physical craving for the drug, but also for the much greater and more sinister force of obsession by disembodied addicts who seek such abnormally open channels for the gratification of their still persisting desire. This accounts for the powerful and all-compelling, all-so-called irresistible impulse, which overwhelms the weakened wills of even those who are seemingly cured by proper institutional treatment. The moment they are released into the outer world where the drug can be obtained. But even these earthbound disincarnate addicts can be educated to cease their obsessing influence as is illustrated by a message recently received by Dr. Wickland of Los Angeles, California from the Wallace Reed the well-known motion picture star who committed suicide in despair of ever curing his drug addiction. Dr. Wickland reports him saying, as I was in such misery and so helpless that many spirits demonstrated through me and I had no one who understood how to help me conquer the soul craving. Many, many come back and try to get their drug even a little bit and they ruin others against their will. I know many times that I myself did not want it, but there was much, a strong power 
back of me. If the world could only know, only if I could only warn and help others, why did not someone warn me? We understand that many such cases have been cured in Dr. Wickland's clinic. It is just such a warning that this conference is organized to give. So no such a reproach to our civilization can be made. This fact of psychic obsession also accounts for those crimes of irresistible impulse of which the, the perpetrator knows nothing after the obsessing influences passes away and he returns to his normal consciousness. All such belong to the same class as the drug addict, namely self-indulgent, weak-willed, or hypersensitive individuals who allow the doors of their minds to swing idly to and fro in negative mental states, or those whose psychically, psychic immunity has been weakened or destroyed, both of which make them easy victims to the inrush of any outside but positive detriment thought force. There is a vast difference, however, not only in degree, but in kind between strong telepathic suggestion from the mental and spiritual world as a definite psychic invasion from astral world all the differences between an unlifting spiritual inspiration and demonical possession. It should be remembered that sudden and strong impulses from the invisible, both good and evil, construct and destruct, inspiring and depressing, come not in words unless one is clairaudient but by the inrush of a new idea or current of thought force, which makes a compelling and often overwhelming impression. Those of positive mentality, developed wills and high moral character are able to check and control such inbrushes until they can examine what them and decide what their reaction should be. Those of weak mentality or will who are hypersensitive to outside impressions tend to give way to and express such impulses without due consideration. They respond to the negative or evil suggestion more readily because such usually appeal to some form of self-indulgence or because they require less exertion of positive will than the good and constructive impulses. Hence mental poison acute discrimination is a vital point to be taught in any campaign of education on any subject. During the World War, thousands were induced to use narcotic drugs, not only to ease their discomforts and suffering <laughs> and to forget the horrors of the war, but also to give them the reckless pseudo fighting courage of the addict and enable them to play the grandose part, which is one of the symptoms of drug addiction. And the sudden passing over into the invisible world of thousands of such addicts in the full tide of life and still ruled by strong earthly desires have been an important psychic factor in the alarming increase of narcotic drug addiction since the war. Yesterday, we were told by one of the speakers that since the confirmed drug, addict, drug addict cannot be cured, the only solution to the problem was to kill them off. From what we have said above, you will see that apart from all humanitarian consideration, such a course would be the worst thing that could be followed. In fact, this is the fundamental psychological argument against all capital punishment. For as long as those who are dangerous to society are kept confined, society is protected from them. But if we destroy their physical bodies, we simply send them out into the astral world where they could prey upon humanity 10 or 100, 100, yes, a thousand times more viciously than if they were set free while still in the flesh. From the above hasty survey, we see that narcotic drug addiction is far more than a habit. It is a definite psychic disease affecting the etheric and astral bodies primarily and physically, physical body only secondary. This is evidenced by the fact that just as no destructive anatomical or structural changes can be found in the brains of those suffering from certain psychic types of insanity, neither can be found in the tissues of the drug addict, even by our best pathologists. The fact that the chemical end products of narcotic drugs are practically unknown in our physiological chemists can find no trace of the drug in the ex excreta is not 
at all surprising because it has simply passed through the physical body into the astral world once it once in essence originated leaving perhaps only a trace of its irritating passage and a slight inflammation of the liver or gallbladder other drugs which produce sleep also open the door into the invisible world and permit the consciousness to leave the body but the less corroding and degenerative effects upon the psychic immunity as a matter of fact nearly all the alkaloids and vital essences as well as flavors, perfumes in all vegetation are really ethereal substances from an invisible world materializing the physical through the synthesizing power of the life force of the plant and so temporarily manifesting on earth. All that really belongs to the physical world is the little that is left behind as ash when the plant is burned. All else comes from the invisible and returns again to its source. The common fear of mankind of having anything to do with the disembodied is an instinct which has been a boon to the unenlightened masses of mankind in general, for it has acted as a factor in protecting its psychic immunity and has thus served an excellent purpose in the preservation of a race. But fear is dispersed by knowledge, and in this enlightened days, while fear still has its value for the vast mass of the unenlightened and less advanced, it must be overcome by the proper education of those who are ready to enter into new fields of consciousness. But there is still great danger unless this is done with the full knowledge of at least basic laws of realm to be invaded. Hence the promiscuous dabbing in psychic matters as a pastime or as a means of amusement and without proper instruction in its laws and dangers is a dangerous as to let a group of children play unattended in a generator room of a gigantic electric plant. Drug addict, a drug addiction can therefore be treated with a hope of permanent cure only by recognition of its unlying psychic as well as physical factors. For even after apparent physical cure, the victim is never safe until he is thoroughly drilled into watching for and recognizing the suggestions both of his old associates, his environment, the drug peddlers, and the irresistible impulse of the disembodied. And furthermore, has he will develop and strengthen to the point where he can neutralize and overcome such suggestions in his own strength, or he will or with the help of those higher powers and spiritual forces which are involved through prayer and aspiration. And he should remain under the control until he has proved such ability. This is the most important point in completing the permanent cure of the addict. For if it's doubtful, if the etheric wall between the two worlds can be regenerated and rebuilt with sufficient stability to give unconscious psychic immunity. Let us now pause to emphasize the statements made yesterday by Major Brewster and confirmed to me personally by Dr. O'Connor. You will remember that these gentlemen are in charge of the narcotic section of the New York City Department of Correction. Major Brewster being the warden and Dr. O'Connor, the medical expert of this institution. Since they are the heads of the department in the largest city in the world, they are probably the greatest living authorities on their respect of this problem. And when they tell us after an experience with 20 or 30,000 patients coming under their treatment, when they tell us, as Major Brewster did yesterday, that as far as they know, out of the great mass or army, only a few, I think he said five or six that he knew of after the physical results, had been cured and they had gained 30 to 40 pounds in weight, become robust in physical health. Only five or six could survive temptation and relapse after they went back to the outer world where the drugs could be obtained. And why? These few, Major Brewster said, were among those who had only a slight addiction, whose cases were not chronic and who had not gone on to the enormous doses of chronic users. Now, what is the meaning back to back of such a statement as this is significance. I hold that it absolutely confirms that the contemption of my thesis, because these were cases which had not gone to the point where the power of will in the patient had become absolutely destroyed. So they will 
they were able, through the exercise of their will, decidedly to resist the inrush of the suggestion and temptation that came to the addict when he returns to his old environment. In other words, their psychic immunity had not been completely destroyed. You will notice if you study the program of this conference, a remarkable thing that the medical profession tells us there is no cure for the confirmed drug, uh, drug addict. And there is not one proposition presented on the whole program of this conference of a curative or a constructive nature for the help of the addict. There is one paper on a later day presenting a remedy for the spread of addiction, perhaps, but not one for the cure of the addict. But in this paper, I hope I have presented to you constructive, practical, rational, and psychological sound method of completing the cure and bridging that all important gap between the physical cure and the psychic cure. And that is by the proper institution and control of physically regenerative person as to his psychological responsibility and his ability to resist psychic invasion and suggestion. All drug cases, therefore, in my opinion, should be kept confined apart from society until they have been trained and have been demonstrated their ability to maintain their psychic immunity and self-control under tempting conditions that they will not respond to the appeals made to them under such terrible circumstances. Dr. Hubbard, how long will that take? Dr. Curtis, it depends on the case and the amount of treatment. Now then, I take the liberty of presenting and hope that some delegate of this conference will feel impelled to present this as a resolution, certain recommendations, which I feel are not fanatical, but are seen and psychologically sound and not controversial in character. I therefore recommend that in addition to whatever other means this conference adopts in its educational program, it will include the necessary specific teachings as these definite psychological principles first, the power of suggestion and the means of neutralizing adverse suggestions. Two, the personal responsibility of everyone, not only for his acts and words, but also for his thoughts. Third, the necessity for conscious discrimination before accepting any suggestion or any thought and reacting to it. And lastly, the necessity for cultivating self-reliance and independence. In closing, permit me to quote two stanzas of a well-known hymn. Down from their home on high, down through the starry sky, angels descending fly while the earth shaketh. Roll they the stone away from where the Savior lay, out into his glorious day, he, his way he taketh. Let us pray that this conference shall so invoke the uplifting and inspiring angelic forces of light, life and power in the spiritual realms that they shall descend down through this starry sky of our unselfish thought for the salvation of mankind, while those earthbound souls who traffic in the youth of the world shall tremble. Understanding scientifically and precisely what we are doing, may the organized and psychologically planned worldwide campaign of narcotic education inaugurated by this conference roll away the stone of ignorance and prejudice which has so long imprisoned the higher spiritual or Christ consciousness, the savior of mankind, that it may come forth from the tomb of materialism as free and unhampered out into the glorious days of spiritual realization of the essential brotherhood and oneness of mankind. His way he taketh. Amen. Chairman Hobson, this is a very remarkable paper to which we have listened. It is now open for discussion, but before the discussion begins, I ask the doctor one question. In Los Angeles, a perpetual revival goes on. I have found cured addicts at this revival who go down among their fellow addicts in the same environment and remain cured. I don't know how for how long. Have you any explanation for that, having been cured in the revival and remaining cured after that? Dr. Curtis, I think a little serious consideration of my paper will give the answer. 
Such cases are the result of something that the medical profession cannot duplicate. The result is brought about, uh, brought as I said, first through definite currents of spiritual force and second by definite spiritual helpers who are positively invoked. They have been known to help build up the weakened will and establish self-control during that the time they have helped to protect the unfortunate addict from obsessing entities because it is conscious of that presence with him which will bring about his freedom from his, this slavery. Dr. Hubbard, so divorced, or at least not necessarily connected, are these four points that the speaker has presented, so not connected with any mystic philosophy that I'm sure we can all agree to these four points. I am certain that we have no difference in regard to them, but there is a question about our joining forces with another kind of philosophy. Is it not true that the unnaturally depraved appetite within and the sinister temptations of the dope peddler are consorted to break down the man's resistance against the form of evil without invoking the power of disembodied spirits? I believe and feel certain that the unnatural depraved appetite within gives an easy response to the temptation of dope peddlers. And I am sure we get the result without unnecessarily involving other ourselves in a philosophy which we have no never entertained i do not think that we are called upon to take a new philosophy in order to deal practically with this problem i'm satisfied to take the speaker's word that if we think strongly persistently sensibly along the right line of activity for our proper aim we can have it and by thinking strongly consistently pers perpetually of a noble resolve, a higher ideal, such an amendment to the constitution, we can have it. Dr. Curtis, I call the attention of the conference to the fact that I have not asked the conference to subscribe to any new psychic philosophy at all, but simply to more firmly establish certain fundamental psychological education principles and really use the psychic philosophy to give you a rational and scientific understanding of what takes place both physically and psychically in new in drug addiction and what is necessary to perfect a cure. Now, as to the naturally depraved tendencies of mortal man producing addicts, it cannot be. This is a lot, guys. Even the naturally depraved mortal must actually take the narcotic, and that is what breaks down the natural psychic immunity of the subject. And so he proceeds with his self-indulgence he proceeds with his woeful violation of spiritual law, and there is a consequent destruction of all willpower and realization of his utter failure to cope with any situation that he brought face to face with. Dr. Ward, as I listened to Dr. Curtis' remarkable paper, two thoughts occurred to me. One was a point that he called attention to, and that is that he that his is the only paper on the agenda that deals with the psychological aspects of the subject. And that means the inner responsibilities, these four points, which Dr. Curtis brought forth and Dr. Curtis in points, which Dr. Oh, investigation and paper to me indicate a direct answer to our rampant modern philosophy, the philosophy of modern criminology, which holds that man is not a responsible being that to talk of his psych psychology from the sense of the spirit and unless a, and a waste of time, Dr. Curtis's paper is a direct answer to that. The regeneration of man can come only from his most innermost soul and to treat man simply as a sort of machine without responsibility, without obligation to his God is aimed at a destruction of society. We can only view man as a responsible agent of possession of a will, which he must answer for one day to his God and think Dr. Curtis's paper heartedly supports that thesis. He did stress one point that there was only one cure and that was self-discipline to, self-discipline is salvation of the drug addict. And he said that the responsibility for the drug addiction, the ultimate responsibility lies with our educators who do not recognize a definite authoritative morality 
And on the other hand, with the parents of the child who are not responsible for every moment of their time, the child from its earliest years must be taught that this is a moral agent and responsible for its life, responsible for its soul to God. A resolution embracing the four recommendations made by Dr. Curtis was passed by unanimous vote and referred to the Committee of Resolutions. And that is the Realms of the Living Dead. I'm sad. I love this book. It's really good. The reason why I went on to long read, but do that is... For the people that are in my life, for the people who have been in my life, and for the people that are outside of my life, but connected to acquaintances, friends, old friends from high school and whatnot, I have lost a significant amount of people to drug overdoses. A significant amount. And in fact, in the last two weeks, I lost five people that I didn't know, I knew directly, but I hadn't been like, you know, best friends with, but I knew them. I went to high school with a lot of them and at least two of them were ODs. Um, 90% of my friends have been affected by drug abuse. Abuse and addiction. I lost too many, too many good people to this. This puts a lot into perspective. A lot of perspective is needed to take this book and apply it to people who have an addiction. And there is a lot that does cover this in earlier chapters. So I please, if there is anybody who has someone struggling in addiction, no matter if it's narcotic or not, please have them listen to this. I think it's very important right now in this spiritual war that we understand the things that are influencing us the things that are being given to us that we need to discern it that we need to go within with it and then we respond is it something that we are resonating with or not is your will strong enough to surpass the impulses that you're being given A lot of people will fail at that, but it's just something that we need to be more cognizant of so that we can help others who are not strong-willed to overcome their addictions and help them on the spiritual and physical basis. So guys, this is the end of this book. I'm really sad. Thank you for sticking in because that was a long section. Please don't forget to have the thumbs up button. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I thank you for that and share to maybe somebody that might need at least this section. There are other chapters that go over this. I'm not here to scare anybody with the spiritual war that's happening right now, but it's happening right now. There's so many people fighting for their soul's essence right now. I'm at battle every day for what I am. It's not easy. I have to start not listening to things because it gets me angry. And it's not because it's triggering me. It's because of the ignorance, not looking outside the paradigm of what they are taught and I'm just ignored in the chats because, oh, what am I? I'm the nut. I don't know anything. Nope. She crazy. So that stuff is just a waste of my time and my energy. So I'm just transcending it and just, you know, when it's their time to learn, they will find me. Or they will find other people that speak similarly to me, at least getting you an open mind. 
opening up your mind to other paradigms. Just because it's in a book doesn't make it correct. Just because you thought it doesn't make it correct. Because again, this book shows you anything could influence your thoughts thoughts if you allow it and most people are not consciously aware of that so where are people getting their in little tidbits from yeah i saw that too there's a lot i'm supposed i supposedly have like a huge highway of the dead that's always around me and and the other day doing a reading i did see something like a a little diva behind me like doing that behind me yeah i have a lot of that i mean that's why i have the, the bear my whole house is barren essentials of sage everywhere grids everywhere black salt everywhere prayers meditations a lot of good stuff but that's just me. That's how I do me. Sending each and every one of you protection, light, love, and shielding. Please have a really good weekend. We're almost there. And please don't forget. We're at war. Guard your soul. Because you're needed. Till the next one, guys. And a new book will come forth eventually. I have to feel if you have to see which one I can. Till the next time, guys. <laughs>